Well, it's President's Day today, and we are in the thick of the campaign season, with four remaining GOP candidates crisscrossing the country, preparing for another round of presidential primaries. Arizona and Michigan, a week from tomorrow, and of course, Super Tuesday, coming up on March 6th. Now, over the weekend, GOP presidential hopeful Ron Paul was in Kansas City, Missouri, speaking at the Union Station there to a crowd of more than 1,000 people. He came out with a pretty strong warning about the direction this country is headed in. And we should mention, uh, I'm going to show you something, uh, a part of that speech, but I want to tell you this video was shot on a cell phone. You should be able to hear it, but it's not the best video quality. Now we're slipping into a fascist system where there's a combination of government and big business and authoritarian rule and suppression of the individual right of each and every American citizen. That is what we have to reverse and get the people to agree with us. All right, so again, Ron Paul saying the U.S. is slipping into a fascist system dominated by government and businesses. Strong words there from the Texas congressman, and as usual, they are words largely ignored by the mainstream media. So we thought we'd take some time to talk about this more in depth. Let's go to journalist Michael Tracy in Montclair, New Jersey. Michael, uh, as someone who has yet to win a primary in this campaign, these are seen by some people as strong words, derogatory words, even offensive by many. Why do you think Ron Paul felt the need to say this about the direction that the U.S. is heading in? Well, this is, this is something that Ron Paul has been saying for quite a while now. I think I remember an interview with him in 2007 where he said that, you know, the state of the country amounts to soft fascism. So. I don't think he's trying to say that the United States is on a path to, you know, Hitler-esque uh, uh, suppression, but you know the, the way that he characterizes the situation, I, I think, speaks to a, uh, a growing apprehension that a lot of people have about the way that the country is headed. And I think, you know, Ron Paul has gained traction not because he's hedged his remarks, but because he, you know, uh, shoots from the hip. And some of the, those that, as you say, the growing apprehension um, and some of those concerns have been articulated in the last several months by uh, the Occupy Wall Street movement. I'm wondering, Michael, do you think that uh, Ron Paul is sort of reaching out to these people, letting them know, uh, people who identify themselves as the 99 percent versus the 1 percent, uh, you think he's trying to, to make sure they know he's on their bandwagon? Well, remarkably, if you've been following the uh, presidential debates throughout the fall and into the into the winter, every now and then Ron Paul will say something, you know, on his own volition, invoking his own his support for aspects of the Occupy Wall Street movement. And he said that he has an affinity with both the Tea Party and the Occupy Wall Street movement. So I think there's that there's a void that he's filling, pretty remark, and he's a pretty, pretty remarkably a unique figure in that sense that you know he can extend an olive branch to both of these uh, movements, which you know the the mainstream media casts as in, co in uh, conflict with one another. I think he, he shows that there's a, a uniting sentiment that's driving both of them to some extent. Let's talk about that void that he's filling. I mean, uh, talk to me, Michael, about in what way you think Ron Paul has sort of changed the discussion in this country. Whether he's won primaries or not, he's still in there. You know, there were nine, and now there are four candidates left. He is still one of them, and he has decidedly different opinions about what is most important in this country. What do you think his role has been thus far? Well, one of the striking dynamics throughout this primary season is that the televised debates have been, have been very important. So regardless of what kind of uh, polling Ron Paul attains or what his uh, delegate count is, the fact that he's given the national platform on a fairly regular basis and is able to disseminate his views you know, before an audience that you know, ranges from hostile to sympathetic, I think is, is really significant. And if you have attended or watched video of any of Ron Paul's uh, campaign appearances as of late, he always mentions, well, basically without except, almost without exception, the NDAA, for example, which uh, you know, allows for the indefinite detention of American civilians, as we all know. And this is something that would never even be remotely discussed if it were, uh, if Ron Paul or someone of his ilk were excluded from the contest. Uh, so this event Saturday night in Kansas City, Missouri, kind of interesting. It was at the same time as a more sort of establishment Republican event. It was a fundraising banquet of some kind, some heavy-hitting Republican people there um, speaking. 
And word on the street is that, that quite a few Republicans left that fancy banquet to actually go hear Ron Paul speak and to hear his message. Uh, I want to get your thoughts on Ron Paul and his place in his own party. Well, it's very interesting. I, I think in the past few months, it's become clear that there are quite a few Republicans, especially the Republicans that skew toward the younger end of the spectrum, who kind of privately support Ron Paul. Um, but for reasons of uh, professional image, maybe aren't able to be vocal about it or to, uh, you know, ruffle feathers by coming out and, you know, it's outright endorsing. Them. But for a while now, there's been kind of murmurings of how uh, Ron Paul is gaining traction among this younger demographic. And, uh, you know, as, as I said before, the fact that his message has been so uh, widely disseminated shows that, you know, he's gaining a lot of traction. And this, this is actually causing a fissure within the Republican Party that I think is going to have pretty la uh, lasting implications regardless of the outcome of this contest. I mean, I think in the future, you're going to have, uh, you know, Ron Paul is going to be become a respected figure within the party establishment, um, even if he's, if it appears that he's shunned now because of the ideological resonance of a lot of what he's saying. Speaking of ideology, um, some of what he says it seems very different from some of these candidates. Um, but some of what he says has also been around for a really long time. Um, certainly one of his most outspoken messages and harshest critiques is about the wars that the U.S. is currently involved in, uh, was involved in, and spends money on. And um, this is also a warning that came decades ago, 50 years ago, from President Dwight D. Eisenhower in his farewell address um, back in 1961. I want to play a little bit about what he said and then talk about its relevance today. In the councils of government, we must car guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. So, Michael, talk a little bit about this message from Eisenhower, uh, somewhat similar today uh, from Ron Paul, and what it all means in, uh, you know, for today, especially with, with considering how many people are really just sick of the wars that we've been fighting in for the last 10 years. Right. Well, with the codification of many of Bush's worst excesses in terms of foreign policy by Obama, it's become clear that it's virtually impossible for the American citizenry to signal its disapproval of the uh, military-industrial complex by way of traditional electoral avenues. I think that's what Ron Paul was speaking to with his comments from over the weekend. Um, uh, so, and, and because you know, voting for Obama did not really attain any uh, action, practicable change in, in, uh, in that regard. Ron Paul's presentation of himself as a you know, radically different alternative, I think, is gaining a lot of resonance. And you know, for, for Ron Paul to uh, warn about the dangers of the military industrial complex on such a regular basis, I think, is uh, implanting that idea and the distrust of the, that institution within a, a new generation of uh, politically aware individuals. I think, yeah, nobody would argue that uh, he is the most different out of all the candidates out there. Journalist Michael Tracy speaking to us about Ron Paul from Montclair, New Jersey.